September 1972, Washington, D.C., Office of the United States Central Intelligence Agency. Recall that this was the name of the Office of National Intelligence until April 21, 2005. On the desk of Director Richard McGarrah Helms are photographs of a spy satellite. One of the photographs shows a huge, ugly apparatus of a completely unknown design hovering over the water surface of the Caspian Sea. That's how the U.S. military first learned about the VVA-14 project. The abbreviation VVA stands for Vertically Taking Off Amphibious. Sleeping Pterodactyl VV-814, or Spy Detective. Until that moment, there was only indirect information about the appearance of something similar in the Soviets. First, the secret decree of the Council of Ministries of the USSR and the Central Committee of the CPSU No. 935320 from November 11, 1965, on the creation of new aviation weapons against missile-carrying submarines, fell into the hands of American analysts. This was the first information about the start of full-scale development of a vertically taking off amphibious aircraft with 14 engines. This decree was followed by the order of the Ministry of Aviation Industry of the USSR No. 371, dated November 26, 1965, and the tactical and technical requirements for the amphibian. It became known that the power plant of the future apparatus should receive two sustainers and 12 lifting engines. Later, the decision of the Commission of the Presidium of the Council of Ministries of the USSR on Military Industrial Issues No. 305 of November 20, 1968, and the order of the Ministry of Aviation Industry No. 422 on December 25, 1968, on the development of a technical design of an aircraft at the Taganrog Machine Building Plant were issued. However, at the time, the overwhelming majority of American experts doubted the Russian miracle mistaking VVA-14 for a successfully carried out hoax. The goal being to make Washington nervous and steer military research in the wrong direction. Such tricks are not uncommon in military affairs. Experts assured that such a large aircraft ship could not be an effective means of combat. The idea of building such devices for military purposes, be it a transport ground effect vehicle or its armed version, has no prospects although there were some specialists who believed in the reality of the idea. Now everything has come together. In a few years, the Soviets have built an apparatus which resembles a pterodactyl with folded wings in its appearance. The real VVA-14 got an extremely unusual look. The fuselage with the cockpit smoothly passes into the center section. On the sides, there are two huge compartments with floats and their pressurization system. It was these aggregates that resembled the folded wings of a pterodactyl. The detachable parts of the wings were attached to the center section caisson. The wingspan reached almost 94 feet, and the length of the apparatus exceeded 85 feet. Among Soviet military specialists, VVA-14 received the nickname Phantomus because of its original design. The technical characteristics were no less impressive. The maximum speed was declared at 452 miles per hour, cruising almost 400 miles per hour. The loitering speed was 224 miles per hour. The range of the VBA-14 at this speed was more than 2,000 miles. At the same time, the practical ceiling was a Grandmaster's 33,000 feet. VBA-14 was armed with two aircraft torpedoes. An alternative could be eight IGMD-500 aircraft mines or 16 PLAB-250 aircraft bombs. IGDM-500 is a bottom, no-contact, two-channel induction hydrodynamic aircraft and ship mine, effective at depths of 25 to 100 feet. PLAB-250 are still in use by the Russian Navy Aviation. The effectiveness of these bombs reaches 650 feet. As such, the maximum combat load of the VVA-14 was almost 9,000 pounds. The gross vehicle weight was 115,000 pounds, a number of modifications have been designed, the main one being a ship variant. In this version, VBA-14 could be based on anti-submarine cruisers, large capacity dry cargo ships or tankers. Just this version had folding wing consoles and a folding tail unit. The transport option was designed to carry 32 people or 11,000 pounds of cargo over a distance of up to 2,000 miles. VBA-14 could also be used as a repeater aircraft, the onboard retractable antenna was nearly 1,000 feet long. 
It turned out that the basis for the VVA-14 was the MVA-62 amphibian project developed back in 1962. The chief designer of the project was then Robert Ludwigovich Bartini. He was also involved in the implementation of the VVA-14 project. The real name of the Soviet physicist, designer, and inventor is Roberto Oris di Bartini, an Italian aristocrat, communist, who fled from fascist Italy to the USSR. However, in the Soviet Union, the fugitive was not greeted very warmly. On February 14, 1938, Bartini was arrested by the NKVD of the USSR. The department was headed by Leventry Beria at that time. The scientist was charged with spying for Mussolini. Result? Bartini was imprisoned for eight years. Remember this when dealing with communists. Both the amphibian and its creator were very extraordinary phenomena for their time, including in technical solutions. For example, no one has ever used such an aerodynamic layout and a combination of propulsion and lift engines in one power plant. Although the actual idea of a power plant with different types of engines already existed, in 1940, American engineer D. Warner created an unusual apparatus, which he called a compressor plane. It was basically a boat with wings. The device was kept on the water thanks to the airflow, which was kept under bottom of the case by two powerful fans. But the movement of the device was provided by other aircraft engines with propellers located on the main wing. It was the Americans who invented the power plant with two types of engines and the Soviet designer only improved it. However, let's continue. The control system in transient modes and in-flight and a takeoff and landing device with two inflatable floats, which just endowed VVA-14 with an unusual appearance, turned out to be no less original. All this together raised doubts about the advisability of such an apparatus. However, the Russians were deeply worried about the new American nuclear submarines, and with the help of a lowered hydroacoustic station, VV-8 was able to carry out combat duty afloat and, if necessary, quickly change deployment and maneuver against submarines. The catamaran design ensured stability even with four to five points of ocean roughness. This meant that VVA-14 could be used far from the coast in the open ocean. In addition, the Soviet military was attracted by the amphibious qualities of the aircraft. Even at the stage of creation, Bartini proposed a new concept for takeoff and landing. VV-8 could take off and land vertically, and not only on water, but also on the ground and almost anywhere. Phenomenal! To study the modes of takeoff and landing of VV-8 on various services, a floating gas dynamic test bench was created. For testing, a 1 to 4 scale model of an aircraft was built. Six turbojet engines, TS-12M, imitated the operation of all lifting engines of the aircraft. At first, it was planned to build three experimental VVA-14. Two prototypes of the aircraft were put into production simultaneously, 1M and 2M. The third copy was supposed to appear later. The task of the third prototype was to specifically practice combat use and test the onboard weapons in real conditions. The first prototype aircraft, 1M, was made without lifting engines. The designers improved aerodynamics in all flight modes, research related to directional stability, controllability, and other purely aircraft systems that were not associated with vertical takeoff and landing. At the same time, the VVA-14 structure itself was tested for strength. After all, bulky floats gave strong vibrations to the body of the device. In total, from September 1972 to June 1975, 107 flights were performed on the 1M prototype, with more than 103 flight hours. The second prototype, VVA-14 2M, was supposed to receive lifting engines for vertical takeoff and landing from land and water. On this prototype, jet control systems, automation, and other components associated with vertical takeoff and landing were tested. After some time, Bartini decided to modify the first prototype 1M into an Ekranoplan ground effect vehicle, with air blowing from additional engines under the center section but he was not destined to see the flight of his 14M1P. In December 1974, Bartini passed away. The Ekranoplan nevertheless ascended into the sky. The first flight of VVA 14M1P, with full release and retraction of floats in the air, took place on June 11, 1975. These flights became the final chord in the history of VVA 14.
In 1976, the project was closed and the careers of many U.S. military officials were saved. After the termination of the VVA-14 program, the 1M aircraft was rolled into the workshop for re-equipment, and the assembled glider of the 2M prototype was taken to the far end of the factory parking lot. Construction of the third prototype never started. Today, the International Maritime Organization IMO, classifies ekranoplans as marine vessels. Is there a prospect for such devices now? The very idea of a ship plane is nothing new. It was described at the beginning of the 20th century. The effect is as follows. As one approaches the surface of the water or land, the aerodynamic force on the wing of the aircraft increases. In 1935, Tumas Cario built an ekranoplan with one 16-horsepower engine and a propeller. However, his plane ship flew only a few meters and fell apart. After World War II, he created several more experimental devices, but none of them became serial. This idea was not missed in the USA either. Back in September 1962, the president of Vehicle Research Corporation, Scott Rethorst, presented the project of the 100-ton Ekranoplan Columbia, developed with his personal participation and with the support of the U.S. Maritime Administration. The device was designed according to the flying wing scheme. The design speed was supposed to reach 100 knots or 115 miles per hour. The British also had their own Ekranoplan aircraft carrier project, on which it was supposed to base up to 20 to 30 aircraft. However, the matter did not go beyond plans. It's a shame, because we could be discussing these amphibious aircraft now.